Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Mater at Magistra. I am Jason Brunel. I'm your host this evening, taking you through till 9 o'clock. Um, this show is dedicated to studying the uh, the sacred truths uh, contained in the most holy deposit of faith, uh, preserved, protected, and interpreted by the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Um, and um, we have been using the catechism, uh, the Catholic Church, to uh, go through. Uh, the, we started off uh, beginning with the process of divine revelation, and we're moving through the, um, the various truths of the faith, as the, uh, the, particularly the 12 articles of the faith uh, that are contained in the Apostles' Creed, um, which is an ancient tradition of the church uh, to, to summarize, uh, or I should say to present the catechism uh, according to the 12 truths that are contained in the Apostles' Creed since the Apostles' Creed is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, of the creedal formulations. Uh, we talked, we've talked about the importance of creeds, why creeds are necessary, why they are so important to our faith, um, um, the role that creeds play, um, but at the same time, uh, understanding that... Uh, while the creeds do serve a very necessary purpose in terms of um, bringing into one place uh, the essential truths of our faith, um, we certainly by no means, uh, as Catholic Christians, uh, by no means do we, um, do we enter into a personal relationship with abstract truths we do, of course, give our full assent of intellect and will to the truths that God himself has revealed to us. But ultimately, our faith, ultimately, our act of faith is in a person. And, and ultimately, our, our, the, the most fundamental act of faith is in as well, our, as Christians, our most fundamental act of faith is in Jesus Christ. Um, uh, hence, we call ourselves Christians because it is Jesus Christ whom we uh, know to be and 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 recognize as the eternally begotten Son of God, the Father, uh, consubstantial with the Father, uh, who came in the fullness of time to reveal. Uh, God's to to basically reveal God's plan of salvation to humanity, to reveal Himself uh, and particularly His trinitarian nature, uh, uh, His His nature as as a as a Trinity, God, three persons who who are all um, three persons in one God. So to, we, we came to understand the distinction between person and nature. Um, God came to reveal uh, not only himself to humanity and, and, or to man, but Jesus Christ came to reveal man to man. And um, that is a truth that is contained in the marvelous Second Vatican, doc, uh, Second Vatican Council document, Gaudium et Spes, and which... Uh, Pope St. John Paul the Great uh, never ceased tiring, he never tired of stating that truth and articulating that truth, that Jesus Christ reveals the dignity of man to Christ, uh, or to, to, humanity, to humanity, I'm sorry, it was the, this, uh, um, um, 
But um, so we are uh, going to move on. Today's show is going to be uh, basically a discussion of or a continuation of the issue that we began to talk about last week. And that issue was the situation with uh, Pope Francis. Um, And I came across, I wouldn't have continued it, but I came across a fascinating article. And this article really uh, is, is a really fascinating. It is contained in the Catholic thing. Um, it was written by Elizabeth A. Mitchell. And, um, um, well, let's provide some background. Last week we spoke about how um, a number of <clears throat> very preeminent theologians have um, have published an open letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church, um, and it is uh, a, basically a 20-page letter, and, uh, and I will simply read the introduction to you. Um, open letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church, and this was... Um, presented or published, I believe, uh, during uh, Easter week, 2019. And it begins, Your Eminence, Your Beatitude, Your Excellency. We are addressing this letter to you for two reasons. First, to accuse Pope Francis of the canonical delict of heresy. And second, to request that you take the steps necessary to deal with the grave situation of a heretical pope. We take this measure as a last resort to respond to the accumulating harm caused by Pope Francis's words and actions over several years, which have given rise to one of the worst crises in the history of the Catholic Church. We are accusing Pope Francis of the canonical delict of heresy. For the canonical delict of heresy to be committed, two things must occur. The person in question must doubt or deny by public words and or actions, some divinely revealed truth of the Catholic faith that must be believed with the assent of divine and Catholic faith. And this doubt or denial must be pertinacious. That is, it must be made with the knowledge that the truth being doubted or denied has been taught by the Catholic Church as a divinely revealed truth, which must be believed with the assent of faith and the doubt or denial must be persistent. While accusing a pope of heresy is, of course, an extraordinary, an extraordinary step that must be based on solid evidence, both these conditions have been demonstrably fulfilled by Pope Francis. We do not accuse him of having committed the delict of heresy or even on, on every occasion upon which he seemed to publicly contradict the truth of the faith, We limit ourselves to accusing him of heresy on occasions where he has publicly denied truths of the faith and then consistently acted in a manner that demonstrates that he disbelieves these truths that he has publicly denied. We do not claim that he has denied truths of the faith in pronouncements that satisfy the conditions for an infallible papal teaching. We assert that this would be impossible since it would be incompatible with the guidance given to the church by the Holy Spirit. We deny that this could ever appear to be the case to any reasonable person since Pope Francis has never made a pronouncement that satisfies the conditions for infallibility. That is to say, uh, if Pope Francis were to make make an ex cathedra uh, official dogmatic pronouncement uh, uh, that uh, basically undoing some previously... um, uh, accepted truth of the, of the sacred deposit of faith, um, and, and no such no such um, action has ever been taken by Pope Francis. There have been numerous, um, and, and that that would be considered what we call a, an extraordinary 
act of the magisterium. Um, when, and that, uh, that whole, the very concept of papal infallibility, and this is me speaking now, Jason Brunel uh, commenting on this letter, uh, the whole concept of papal infallibility uh, is, is a reality that, of course, has been, uh, that has been present since the very beginning of the church, but it was not defined as dogma until uh, the first Vatican Council, uh, which took place in the uh, in in the um, in the in the second half of the eighth in the second half of the seventeenth century or I'm sorry the nineteenth century uh, the 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 latter eighteen hundreds so you had Vatican I and Vatican I was the council where papal infallibility was described and defined and and uh, officially uh, officially um, raised to the level of, 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 of the, the, the highest, a teaching of the highest possible caliber. And it was always present. Um, again, uh, in my other show, uh, The Glories of Mary, we, we speak about these um, marvelous truths regarding the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, her role as the, the, the Theotokos, the Mother of God, um, her role is the immaculate, having been immaculately conceived. She is the immaculate conception. She was immaculately conceived, um, and um, it, and it's it's fascinating because when you look at these things, Mary really is the spouse of the Spirit, and she takes the name of her spouse, just like uh, most good Catholic wives do, take the name of their husbands uh, because the two become one. And so, so too did Mary, who is the spouse of the blessed, or is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Mary takes the name of her spouse, and we refer to, we of course we refer to the Holy Spirit as the Advocate, uh, and and so too do we refer to Mary as the Advocate uh, on behalf of the people of God. Um, we refer to Mary as uh, as the as the, the, the dispensatrix, uh, the dispenser of the gifts of God. Uh, certainly we know that the Holy Spirit uh, is, it, 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 the Holy Spirit comes and dispenses the gifts of God, and he does so through, with, and in his spouse, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And St. Maximilian Kolbe marvelously uh, brought to the attention of the Catholic world the reality that um, Mary in revealing herself, Maximilian Kolbe was very fascinated with um, the uh, the revelations at Lourdes, uh, and and how instead of Our Lady stating that she had been immaculately conceived, um, she responded to the question "Who are you?" Uh, with the answer. I am the immaculate conception. So instead of saying I was immaculately conceived, I am the mother of God, I am the, 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 the lady of the rosary, uh, as she stated at Fatima, I am the lady of the rosary. Uh, in Lourdes, uh, she stated to Bernadette when, when asked what her identity was, that she was, in fact, uh, she she was I am the immaculate conception. And this is something that Colby pondered his whole life and reflected upon, and it was right before he was taken away by Nazi soldiers, uh, where he would eventually die in a concentration camp, uh, giving his life for another inmate who was sentenced to death by starvation bunker. Um, there was uh, so many prisoners, I guess one prisoner had escaped, and so a certain number of other prisoners would be randomly chosen to suffer the consequences of this one prisoner who escaped, and they eventually uh, chose a particular man who was married with a family, and he pleaded with them, which was uh, something that uh, I mean, she figured, you know, they're, they're sentencing me to death. I might as well plead with them. So he pleaded for his life. He pleaded to be spared. 
and Maximilian Kolbe stepped out of line, and that act in and of itself was enough to just, you know, if you did the least thing in these, in these, in these concentration camps, the, the Nazi soldiers were just so full of hatred and, and so ready and willing to literally kill people uh, for the, just, just, to, just to kill people. Um, um, uh, you could do the least thing uh, and you could be killed for it. So uh, Maximilian Kolbe really, um, th- that was an, inc- an incredibly heroic act. He said, I am willing to take the place of this man. I am a Catholic priest. He identified himself as a Catholic priest. And, of course, the Nazi soldiers um, delighted in the idea of a Catholic priest, uh, you know, slowly dying, dying a slow death by starvation. So they, they accepted. They took uh, Maximilian Colby and uh, they let the other gentleman go free. Um, and it turned out that Maximilian Colby was the longest to last in the starvation bunker, and he actually did not succumb to starvation. He actually was, uh, everyone else had died eventually, and he was, the, he was, he was still alive. Granted, he, uh, he was, wasn't doing very well at all, um, but just the fact that he was the last one to, to remain alive, that he was on, on the feast, uh, on, the, on the vigil of the Feast of the Assumption, August 15th, uh, on the vigil, August, August 14th, he was given a lethal injection and killed. Um, and it is for that reason that he has come to be known as, he, he's, he is now the patron saint of those who are chemically addicted, um, the uh, persons who suffer addiction to substances um, uh, be, uh, because of that, because of the way he died, um, uh, pay the patron of, of the addicted, of, of substance abusers. He's also the patron saint of, uh, of many, 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 many things. His incredible devotion to Our Lady and his utter commitment to um, promoting um, the incredibly beautiful devotion of um, uh, total consecration of oneself to Jesus through Mary um, and his beautiful act of consecration to Mary and, and, and doing everything in his power to live his total consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, so that is, that is something that we can focus on as a, and, and I bring that up in a, not only as an example of, um, uh, you know, the, the, of course, that, that stemmed from my other show and the, the various teachings of Our Lady. Mary, well, I eventually, I, I, I told that story. Mary, Mary uh, Colby, right before he was taken away, he revealed to the world, well, he was able to write down and eventually... This, this piece of information was spread about, Colby realized that Mary took the name of her spouse, the Holy Spirit, that, that, that the Holy Spirit is the uncreated, immaculate conception that he, as, as the, the Holy Spirit, as the love that exists between the Father and the Son, uh, the Holy Spirit, who, who is the, the divine personification of the, of the love between the Father and the Son. The love between the Father and the Son is so real, so intense, so metaphysically real and intense, that it actually blossoms into the third divine person of the Holy Spirit. So we can refer to and think of, truly, uh, the Holy Spirit as the uncreated, immaculate conception, as the as the eternal product or spiration of the love that exists between the Father and the Son. And Mary, of all created beings, of all created beings, 
was more filled with grace than any other creature. And she, like, like the Holy Spirit, uh, well, actually, Maximilian Kolbe went so far as to say that Mary was the quasi-incarnation, uh, or that the Holy Spirit quasi uh, incarnated himself in the Blessed Virgin Mary. So th- we're not saying that the Holy that Mary is a uh, you know Mar- Mary is not the incarnation of the Holy Spirit as Jesus Christ is the incarnate Word of God. However. Um, Mary, more so than any other creature, is so filled with her divine spouse, the Holy Spirit, that you could say the, the intimate relationship between them is, is sufficiently intense for us to state that the Holy Spirit almost, you, you can almost think and, and of course, certainly, of, of the two, of, of the three divine persons of the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the only divine person um, who, who was not, who is not fecund. And the Father, of course, is fecund in giving rise to the Holy Spirit, you know, vis-a-vis his relationship with the Son. And the Son uh, is gives rise to the Holy Spirit vis-a-vis his relationship with the Father. So it's that reciprocity of love between the Father and the Son that gives rise to the divine personification of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit turns out to be the only divine person who is not fully fruitful in the sense that the Father and the Son, in the same manner that the Son, the Father and the Son are. However, uh, there certainly are parallels and um, and so uh, it was Maximilian who came to that profound understanding that Mary, in in calling herself and stating that she was the Immaculate Conception, she was simply she she was simply again taking yet another name uh, that was originally. Uh, given to her divine spouse, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the uncreated Immaculate Conception, uh, and Mary is the created Immaculate Conception. Uh, Like we said before, Mary is the advocate because the Holy Spirit is the advocate. And um, so it's just a, a, a beautiful thing. But these are the truths uh, regarding Our Lady, um, that uh, we that 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 come from the sacred deposit of faith, they're contained in sacred scripture, at least in seminal form. At least there are seeds. Um, if when it comes to the Marian doctrines and dogmas, um, we may not have full explicit statements in sacred scripture, but we certainly have a rich tradition uh, that dates back all the way to the early church fathers, uh, whom we refer to in theology as the patristics, which is the study of the early church fathers and their teachings and the roles that they played in laying the theological foundations for for the, the various truths that we believe today. And as I made that, attempted to make that statement earlier that um, as, as, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we primarily make an act of faith in Jesus Christ as the Word of God, the, the eternally begotten Word of God who assumed a true human nature in order to offer himself as the perfect Lamb of God who, who, would, who would take away the sins of the world. Uh, who would offer the perfect ransom, uh, who would offer the perfect atonement for the sins of humanity. And um, there's that marvelous scripture passage, um, sacrifice and oblation uh, you have not wanted, but, but a body you have 
prepared for me, O Lord. And that is precisely referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, um, that it, it, it would be ultimately the offering of our Lord Jesus who would assume a true human nature with a true body, a true human body and a true human soul, uh, a body you have prepared for me, uh, that Jesus, in becoming an author, a, a, truly a human person, in addition, a, 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 in, I should say, in assuming a human nature, he was not a human person. His, his personhood is divine. Um, technically speaking, he is a divine person from all eternity. Um, and he has a divine nature, and he, but he assumed a human nature. But um, all of this uh, was a, uh, uh, stated as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to uh, make the distinction between the extraordinary magisterium and the ordinary magisterium. Uh, the extraordinary magisterium uh, is, uh, is when the Pope makes proclamations from the chair, uh, the Latin phrase uh, for that is ex cathedra, uh, from the chair. And uh, that, is, that is an extraordinary act. And it doesn't happen very often. And Pope Francis has not made any ex cathedra statements. So there is no formal heresy that he can be accused of. Um, and they make a distinction between formal and material heresy. But this document is of, of tremendous importance because it, it, getting back to the accusations uh, uh, level that Pope Francis, um, I think there are many, many, I don't think, I, it's, it's, it's a given. We are deeply confused. Um, uh, uh, the faithful sons and deeply confused in what many believe to be the worst crisis in the history of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> I certainly feel that way. I felt that way for a very long time now. Um, and it gives me a sense of relief that other people, uh, especially really bri truly brilliant uh, theologians like Aidan Nichols, uh, are coming out and, and, and you know, signing this document. Um, when this document first came out, um, I think there were just a, just a small number of signatories, but they were persons of, 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 of erudition and, 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 very, and very significant learning who, who held significant academic posts and very significant Orthodox Catholic universities, persons who were known for their uh, impeccable theological and philosophical uh, uh, acumen, and um, so it, 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 I think it came to many Catholics as a, a kind of an affirmation of, 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 a, of a something that many. Catholics who, who understand what's been taking place, the, 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 the fear, the concern, um, the, the sense of being deeply uh, ill at ease uh, with this whole situation. Um, and, of course, we, you know, many of us know that prior to this, this, prior to this most recent open letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church, um, which... Uh, accuses Francis of the, the canonical uh, delict of heresy uh, on, on seven particular accounts. Um, there was, of course, the, um, the letter of, of um, Archbishop um, Carlo Maria Vigano, who, uh, who was the apostolic, who, who served as the uh, Apostolic Nuncio um, in the United States, in the United States of America, and in, in, while he was serving in that capacity, um, he became personally aware of the, the 
unbelievable situation with um, Archbishop, uh, Cardinal Archbishop Theodore uh, McCarrick um, and, uh, and the, the numerous um, accusations that had been leveled against him uh, of, 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 of not simply sexual misconduct, but, but actual, uh, you know, predatory sexual behavior with, se- with both seminarians and uh, adult priests in his diocese. Uh, and and, and uh, there were certain, you know, key persons who knew of this and who wrote to the Vatican. Um, and uh, Francis... Uh, knew of this. Uh, he was made aware of this. Uh, and not only did Francis not take action, but he actually, he reached out to um, Cardinal McCarrick uh, as, a, as a special consultant, someone who he would, who he would um, turn to in assisting him with the choosing of, of who would be uh, uh, who would make a, a good bishop or a, or a good cardinal or what have you in the United States of America, uh, given the preeminent position that McCarrick was given as Cardinal Archbishop of, of Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. So um, just simply the fact that Francis knew all of this and didn't and, and not only did he, and, and as it turned out, uh, it was later revealed that um, this was known. Uh, it turned out that Pope Benedict uh, had received, had also received uh, information about these about uh, about the dubious nature uh, of and the, these nefarious acts committed by uh, Cardinal McCarrick and. Um, um, Pope uh, Pope Benedict did, in fact, um, place McCarrick under house arrest. Um, yet, uh, Pope Benedict, who was the who was at the time the Pope of the entire Catholic Church, uh, and was in Rome who lived in Rome and worked from Rome, uh, and uh, yes, he would make, uh, yes, he made that decision to, um, to um, place, basically place uh, McCarrick under house arrest, but, um, but Pope Benedict could only do so much as, as the Pope in Rome, and as it turned out, uh, McCarrick uh, did not um, comply with the conditions of his house arrest, and during that period uh, when he was supposed to be under house arrest, uh, he was basically going to and fro, and 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 there, it was it was a complete joke. So, uh, um. So, so, so we have this open letter to the bishops by numerous prestigious theologians. We, prior to this, we had the uh, two, two uh, letters, two open letters. Eventually, they became open letters by penned uh, by the hand of Archbishop uh, Carlo Maria Vigano, who, and those, those letters are just... Vigano is, he, he had to go into hiding for his life. He's, I believe he still is in hiding for his life. Um, that's how serious this whole situation is. Um, and, 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 and Vigano was not the first one to speak out. The first ones to really officially speak out were the five, are known as the five dubia cardinals. The word dubia means doubt uh, in Latin. And um, these cardinals uh, were Bren Mueller, uh, let's see, uh, of course, uh, most are familiar with um, uh, Leo Cardinal Burke, um, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, um, who um, 
uh, who is just an, an incredibly orthodox, uh, truly brilliant uh, cardinal, uh, American cardinal, and um, uh, and there were a number of other very, very, very saintly, pious, or deeply orthodox, uh, incredibly gifted men who spoke out, and they uh, basically accused, or they, they didn't accuse, they, they sent uh, the dubia. Uh, there were questions, and, they, and, and it was based on the document Amoris Laetitia, uh, which is the Latin expression for, uh, the, I believe, the love of joy. Um, and... Um, and, and in this document, um, there were uh, found in, uh, in certain footnotes and in certain, in, I believe there was, there was one chapter in particular that was very, very loaded. And it contained, um, uh, it, it, there, there, were, there were many, there were many very, very, significant departures from the traditional moral teaching of the church, particularly with regard to um, the family and particularly, very particularly, in regard to the sexual union of persons who had previously been married in the church and um, were, had, had received a civil divorce and got remarried outside of the church and um, and um, basically, this document was an attempt to reach out pastorally to these individuals who had been previously, uh, you know, the church, the church had always uh, based its pastoral practice on the theological truths of our faith uh, with regard to um, our understanding of the of the, um, the 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 moral situation of a person, people, persons who are in a state of persons who are, um, and it, it's a given. If if a person is 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 living in a state of serious sin or of mortal sin, if a person is living outside of, or, or if a person knows him or herself to not be in a state of grace. Uh, that person may not receive the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist without first going to confession, well, even before going to confession, um, that person, it's, 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 it's a given that when we, when we approach the sacrament of penance, we are going to the sacrament of penance um, with the understanding that um, we must confess any and all serious, grave sins that we are aware of, that, uh, that we are aware of having committed. Um, uh, we must confess those to the priest. Uh, we must confess the, the sins committed. Um, they are, uh, last week we talked about the, the three conditions necessary to uh, for, 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 to determine the morality of an act. We talked about the object, the intention, and the circumstance. And um, if the object is... is um, all, all three of those things have to be good. The, the object itself has to be good. That is to say, the act itself must be good. Uh, the intention with which the act is being committed must be good, and the circumstances surrounding the commission of that human act must be good as well. All three must be good in order for the act to be good as a whole. Um, you know, we can separate and tease these things apart uh, mentally, but of course, in reality, we cannot tease these things apart. They are all part and parcel of one single act. Yet, we can. This is how we ascertain the moral value of of any given act. Um, is the thing that we're doing uh, 
is it is it a good bee? Is is it is it good in and of itself, or or is it evil? Is it is it an if it's if it's an intrinsic evil, um, it's it's not going to be a good act, uh, regardless of one's intentions. Uh, and, and that's that's where we come up with the whole concept of um, the end. And this is this is an official teaching of the church with regard to morality. But the ends never justifies the means. Um, and what does that mean? Well, the ultimate goal uh, of an action, uh, we, for instance, we might, we might say, okay, well, uh, I might have to, if I, if I, if I do a few quote-unquote immoral things for the sake of a greater good, um, well, ultimately that greater good is such a greater good that uh, it will outweigh the, the, the other things that I had to do in order to bring about that greater good. Uh, giving you an example would be, um, would it be morally permissible for you to take the life of a completely innocent human person if it would mean saving the lives of countless millions. Well, that that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a big question when you don't know the teaching of the church. Uh, and even when you do know the teaching of the church, it still is a, it's it's still a really huge question uh, because you know countless millions i you know if if you know if you somehow know that you would save the life of of many 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 or not even countless millions let's let's make it less extreme um, let's say by allowing or by by take by voluntarily taking the life of one person you would save the lives of five people would it be morally permissible for you to take the life of that one innocent person? Many people would espouse a utilitarian approach to this question and would say from a utilitarian perspective that, well, if we're going to save five lives by taking this one person's life, then yes, it's moral to take that one person's life. But Catholic moral teaching knows better. It is, and, and again, that axiom that the end, in this case, the saving of, of, of five innocent persons by sacrificing, or not sacrifice, but literally um, taking the life of an innocent, of one innocent person, um, to a lot of people that, that would be a no-brainer, and they'd say, well, of course it's permissible to take one life to save five. Um, but no, it's, it's never permissible to commit an intrinsic evil, even if the consequence of that act, of that intrinsically evil act, is going to apparently give rise to a quote-unquote greater good. Well, and, and, and this is where church teaching is so necessary. This is why we have the church. This is why Christ established the church, because these questions, without the guidance, without the, without the experience and guidance and the divine revelation of God and the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fullness of the divinely revealed truths that we possess, um, we would not the, the, these these very complex moral issues uh, could could very easily uh, it, it could be very easy to 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 not understand uh, how best to uh, understand the situation uh, without the official teaching of the church and there have been countless very very gifted philosophers who have 
you know, um, moral philosophers and, and even, even moral theologians, uh, Catholic moral theologians, who have asserted, well, you know, the, there are Catholic theologians who, who ultimately are utilitarian in their approach to morality. There are moral theologians that are Catholic that um, they're, they're, when it comes to morality, there really are uh, a number of different ways, a number of different philosophical schools. Uh, and the one that the church has tended to rely on most heavily, and basically the one that the church has made its own, is what we, is what we refer to as natural law theory. Natural law of theory is the truth that simply by studying human nature, um, simply by understanding that, you know, by eating too much, um, it's going to, if, 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 you know, if I sit down to dinner, and, and as I did this evening, and it was a marvelous dinner, and um, you know when to stop. You know, when, when you reach that point where you have had your fill and you, you, you know that if you, you know that you've eaten just enough and to eat any more would lead to a feeling of being uncomfortable. Um, but there are, there are, there have been countless other times where the food was just so tasty and being, being Italian and, you know, those that was big, spicy meat the balls on a big plate of linguine and a, or, or what have you, and the food is so delicious, um, you you continue eating uh, for the sheer enjoyment of eating, and uh, and that gives rise to another principle that which is the the the, ple- the pleasure principle. It, we must understand that. We, we we ought never to pursue pleasure as a as a as a goal. Um, we will never find or experience true pleasure by seeking pleasure itself. Pleasure and and that sense of satisfaction and and, and happiness that comes happiness and pleasure uh, co- uh, co- pleasure. Is, is is God's way of 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 telling you as a human person that you are engaging in um, or I should say when we pursue something that is truly authentically good for us as human persons something that is truly perfective of our human nature. Um, we will experience pleasure. Um, But we can never pursue pleasure for its own sake. Um, But there are many people who attempt to do that, countless people, every single day. Uh, People have turned the pursuit of pleasure into a lifestyle. People have turned pleasure into their God, and they they worship at the... the, uh, altar of pleasure. Uh, pleasure is their God. Um, and um, whether it's uh, food or, 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 or sex or any number of uh, things that, that, that pleasure can be, uh, can, can be associated with, uh, people will attempt to divorce the, the authentic good from the pleasure that accompanies it and in an effort to circumvent, to circumvent the, the, the good and, and seek out the pleasure as an end in and of itself. And that is a surefire way of, of, of really destroying um, the... the, the pleasurable dimension of something. Um, it will be a watered-down um, experience of pleasure that will um, come to an abrupt end and leave one feeling 
deeply guilty for having done something that was morally inappropriate in order to attain that ephemeral, fleeting pleasure. Uh, so it's, uh, but the, and, and, and the danger is that people will do this again and again and again. And as we talked about last week, uh, the more you do something, the easier it becomes to do it again in the future. And that is true both of good deeds and deeds that are not so good. So uh, the, the habit of doing the good, which makes doing the good in the future easier, uh, is what we refer to as virtue, and as opposed to the habit of giving in to vice or the habit of doing evil again and again and again to the point of basically deadening your conscience uh, and slowly but surely silencing the most important voice that you could ever hear, the voice of God speaking to your soul, telling you that you shouldn't be doing this, this is bad. Um, very, very frightening. So, so we've talked about... Um, you know, object, intention, and circumstance. All three have to be good for the, for the act itself to be good. If any one of those three is, is evil or bad, uh, it renders the whole act bad. Moreover, we talked about um, how to differentiate a, a gravely serious mortal sin, a sin unto death, uh, how, to, how to distinguish a mortal sin from a venial sin. And uh, we talked about how improbable um, uh, in order for, to, to, for a person to be guilty of having committed a mortal sin, um, uh, the, 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 there has to be, again, we have a, a group of three. There has to be grave matter. Um, that is to say, the act itself must be gravely immoral. And moreover, the, the person committing that gravely immoral act must have sufficient knowledge that, that that act is gravely immoral. And they must have sufficient freedom of will in freely choosing to, per, to, to perform that action. Um, we also talked last week about how there are impediments to both knowledge and freedom of will. We talked specifically last week about the impediments to knowledge, which are uh, ignorance, obviously. Um, now, when a person simply is not aware that a particular course of action is intrinsically evil, or, or you know, if, you, if a person is not aware that they're dealing with grave matter and that the act that they're about to perform is, 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 is gravely, seriously sinful in and of itself, if they just simply do not know this, this is what we refer to as invincible ignorance. This is a type of ignorance whereby the individual cannot be held responsible for their ignorance because they have no clue that it's wrong at all. Um, and um, you might ask, well, how can a person have absolutely no clue that something that's gravely immoral, how, how could a person be ignorant of that? Well, there are certain, certain things. Um, um, a person might not know that... Um, um, self you know, autoeroticism is a gravely sinful uh, act, uh, and a person could be growing up and, and may have acquired a habit uh, of, of, of engaging in such activity, having no clue that that was uh, a sinful thing, a, a gravely sinful thing to engage in, and. Um, they may come to an awareness of this reality. And, of course, once that awareness has come to, and this is precisely why we are taught that we have an obligation to inform our conscience. We have an obligation to find out what the church teaches on these various issues. And this is, now, now I'm going to deviate from this just for a second to talk again about 
these these accusations leveled against uh, of heresy leveled against Pope Francis. This is this is a this is a real crisis because people's eternal souls are at stake. If you have a man who has who is who is the sitting pope of the Catholic Church stating that it's permissible to to commit the sin of adultery knowingly and 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 with, with full knowledge and full consent of the will and that and, and in certain cases God actually wills you to commit adultery that's basically what Pope Francis has said I mean this is this is out of control um, so this is the problem so so I, I, I wanted to give the official teaching which for 2,000 years has been in place and uh, you know regarding morality particularly with, with regard to human sexuality um, and uh, I can't believe it's nine o'clock already. That's amazing! Wow. Well, we've come to the end of yet another show. Um, I feel like I haven't even gotten started, but there's so much, so much to tackle uh, with this issue. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, continue to guide us and to lead us uh, in the ways of goodness and truth and fill us with his presence uh, that we might always be fully attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, and, and forever faithful to the authentic magisterium of the church um, and the true sacred deposit of faith. Uh, we know that the church is indefectible, um, and and we know that the church cannot teach error in areas of faith or morality uh, in an official capacity. <clears throat> so um, nothing. Uh, we just must pray for um, Pope Francis. We must pray for. Um, this whole situation, this, this whole debacle. And um, let's, let's offer our rosaries this week uh, for Pope Francis. And um, may the Lord bless us, protect us from evil, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.